Okay, uh, welcome. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm the events coordinator for the Small Woodland Owners Group. I'm delighted to announce the first in our uh, new series of monthly webinars for people with an interest in small woodlands. Tonight we have Jill Perkins from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. Um, so I'll, without further ado, I'll pass over to you, Jill, and I will mute myself. Thank you, Sarah. Let me just share my screen. Right, Sarah, just put your thumbs up that you can see that. Fantastic. Thank you so much for inviting me along to talk. I've sort of split this uh, talk into two halves. You're going to have to in indulge me in the first bit because I do want to talk about bumblebees in particular. I want to make sure that everybody understands what fantastic creatures they are and why they're so important. And then the second half is about what you can do in your woodlands, how woodlands play a role in supporting our bumblebees and reversing their declines. So a lot of my uh, pictures have this amazing photographs of bees. If I was in a room with you now, I would ask you to identify that bee for me and ask you whether it's a male or female. Uh, but because I'm not, uh, you are, I'm going to tell you that's a white-tailed bumblebee and it's a female because it's got pollen baskets and the pollen baskets uh, are only collected by the females of the workers of the bumblebees. Um, so, uh, uh, Philip, Philip, you'll need to mute. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and this and this is a rather a wonderful bee. And this is a bilberry bumblebee, or for the Scottish uh, contingent amongst us, it's a blaberry bumblebee. Uh, but very, very good bumblebee for woodlands and uh, on uh, moorlands. Uh, what the, absolutely my favourite bee. So I normally start this uh, with a little story. It's an apocryphal story, but it's quite an interesting one. And it is about uh, uh, a place in China, thousands and thousands of acres uh, of fruit trees are grown, pears, apples, you name it, plums, the whole gamut of different fruits are grown. But over the years that they've managed these orchards, they've been using pesticides. And uh, as a result of that, yeah. in some areas, they've had to resort to hand pollination. Uh, and this is quite an amazing thing, having, you know, destroyed the, the bugs that they didn't want, but destroyed the pollinators at the same time. And you think, well, that couldn't possibly happen in this country, could it? But not a lot of people know that we actually import over 90,000 boxes of commercially farmed bumblebees into this country every year, and they underpin our soft fruit industry. We could not manage without these bees. And it's because of the declines that we've suffered in bumblebees and also the increase in population and increase in the need for soft fruits like our tomatoes and like our, our strawberries and raspberries and blueberries. So these bees, these imported commercially farmed bumblebees are absolutely crucial to under, underpin our food security. Now, this is what our tomato industry looked like. And I don't know if anybody's ever been to Thanet Earth, where, where there's thousands and thousands of acres of glass houses where um, a lot of our tomatoes uh, that you buy in the supermarket are grown and also over in Suffolk. And the reason why, if I can just explain why bumblebees are so crucially important to this particular fruit, it's because they have co-evolved together. Flower, the tomato flower and the bumblebee have co-evolved together over a million years. And what's unusual about the tomato flower is that the pollen is held very tightly in the anther. And there's no nectar. Now, nectar was always the bait that the flower used to get the pollinator in. But tomato flowers don't have any nectar and they also hold the pollen. So in order to get at that pollen, a bumblebee, when it lands on it, it can disconnect its wings from its thorax, where all its muscles are. It can vibrate at exactly 400 hertz and that opens up the anther and releases the pollen. No other insect can do that, only bumblebees. And that's why they're so crucial. It's not just tomatoes. It's the same for, in some respects, blueberries and potato flowers, anything of that family. 
but they've also been found to produce a much better quality fruit for our strawberries and raspberries. And where I live down here in uh, the south of England in Lymington, where we have pick your own strawberries, the farmers here will also use bumblebees to ensure that they get the best crop possible. So these are the, the, the different flowers that are really crucial to be pollinated by bumblebees. If you look down the right hand side, the, the field bean, where it has quite a complex flower. And so the bumblebee, because it's quite weighty, can sit on the keel, which is the lower petal, get right in there with its tongue. So it's really, really important that uh, for our food security that we have bumblebees thriving all over the UK. Now, why bumblebees have uh, declined? The, Bumble the Bumblebee Conservation Trust was formed in 2006 because two scientists, um, some of you may have heard of Professor Dave Coulson, very famous scientist, sort of bumblebee guru of the UK, and his PhD student, Ben Darville, did some research on bumblebees and realized that they were in steep decline. And one of the main reasons was the loss of wildflower meadows. So in, in after the Second World War, we lost 97% of our wildflower meadows. It all went down to food, which was absolutely how it should be. But we now have quite an intensive agricultural system, a monoculture. We have a growing population. We are a small island with a finite amount of land to grow our food. And unfortunately, the worst of it is we waste a third of all the food we produced, which I think is immoral. So it's a very complex story about the decline in bumblebees. And it isn't all about farming as a lot. Obviously, farming has become industrialized and has has made that it made that an issue. But we work with a lot of farmers and they're really keen to get these pollinators on their farms. But it's a very difficult complex complex story to try and try and work out some of you may have heard of neonicotinoids uh, and this was um, a pesticide that was bought in in the 1990s and it's called a systemic pesticide where it's mostly a seed covering uh, for oilseed rape or sugar beet uh, and as it's taken up uh, in the sap the weevil that the farmer doesn't want takes a bite and gets a mouthful of insecticide and dies but nobody really realized at the time that taking it up yeah. into the sap, it also went into the pollen and the nectar. The bees would come along, they'd take uh, um, the nectar and they'd also get a dose of pesticide as well. Now, I often call neonicotinoids no. bayonetting the wound. The wound was made. Pete, you'll need to mute, please, he's Pete. Boom, yeah, he's not listening. Oh, maybe, maybe. Pete. Maybe Pete, can you mute, Leading please? Away. No. Sarah, you might have to ask him to mute. <laughs> um, and so the bees were getting a sublethal effect uh, from the pesticides as well. And then these, these imported bumblebees, some of you may remember uh, as woodland owners, ash dieback. There we were, gaily importing whips from the, the continent, only to find that they were diseased. Uh, and spread to our native ash trees. And that's exactly the same with these, um, these little beauties. When they come in, they go through viral screening, but they can still present a problem. They cannot be released into the wild because they're non-natives. So once they have been um, uh, done their pollination duty, I'm afraid they have to be destroyed. Uh, and the, the humane destruction that they do is they put them in freezers. But, um, Yep, they present a problem to our natives, if escapees who may um, uh, get out of the, the glass houses uh, mixed with our native bees. So I just wanted to, to stress why we should care about the declining bumblebees. And I'll come on to why your woodlands are going to be a crucial part of reversing those declines. Now, some very clever scientists from Reading University back in the uh, 20, I think it was 2017, worked out that if we were to lose all our pollinators, it would cost this country in the region of 691 million pounds. But that doesn't include how we would then go on to pollinate all the things that need to be pollinated. That's just if the pollination stopped. 
And a lot of us already know that pollination is vital for our fruit and our vegetables, but it's also vital for our dairy products. It's very rare that you will have cows grazing on just grass. It's usually a pasture full of herbs like clover uh, and little mouse ear, which give us the quality of our milk and dairy products. And all of those need to be pollinated. All the creatures that depend on the results of pollination, um, the berries and the seeds as comes out, the way our gardens look, the color in our gardens, all down to pollination. So what we call it is an ecosystem service. And although I think these creatures have an intrinsic value of their own, we shouldn't just put a price on them and say, you know, they're here to serve us humans. They are, they have an intrinsic value of their own. And I think we should recognize that as really important. So a little bit about the ecology of bumblebees, and then I'll talk about um, uh, your woodlands and how important they are. So they're social insects. So they live in a, a group together, uh, they're flower visitors, and they're very hardworking pollinators. Now, bumblebees evolved in the Himalayas about 140 million years ago. They actually evolved from wasps, but the reason they have that big furry coat is to keep them warm, and they're actually warm-blooded. So what they can do, back to this wonderful thorax they have, is they can come out when it's quite cold and they can disconnect those wings they can vibrate those muscles in their thorax to warm themselves up which gives them the ability to fly much earlier now honeybees have a much narrower range in which they can work but bumblebees can work very early in the morning and go very late at night so in the uk we have around about 250 species of bee now I've put 25 bumblebees. Most people would argue with me and say, no Jill, there's 24. But we tried to reintroduce a bumblebee that went extinct, extinct the short air bumblebee back into Kent. Um, and we had five years of reintroducing the bee um, and re releasing it, had to be in quarantine and then we released it in, in, in Dungeness. And then we've had the last five years looking for the little thing. And it's really hard to find a bumblebee in a vast area like Dungeness. But I'm still hopeful it, it is out there. So I'm really keen that we, we keep looking for it. So there's one honeybee, Apis mellifera. Uh, some beekeepers may argue with me that there's the black bee. Sometimes there's the Welsh black bee or the Scottish black bee. But they're all the same species. They've just gone feral. They'll still be Apis mellifera. And all the rest, 220 plus, are solitary bees. And these are amazing bees. And these are these are like our bumblebees, are wild bees. And if you ever wanted a, a, a sort of lunch and learn on solitary bees, um, there's a brilliant guy called Stephen Falk who knows all about them. But one of the flowers I showed you earlier on the of, of uh, where, where our food comes from was the apple blossom. And a lot of cider makers use solitary bees. They they have red mason bees imported, not from you, not from outside the UK, but inside the UK, into their into their orchards because red mason bees have got furry abdomens, really hairy abdomens. And when they land on an apple blossom, a nice apple blossom, <laughs> that the pollen all sticks to them, and off they go from flower to flower to flower. They're exceptionally good pollinators. And so all bees get nectar from flowers. That's their fuel that keeps them going and protein rich pollen for growth. And the bumblebees have an annual life cycle. Now I was talking earlier, just before we started about um, some audience insights work we did about four or five uh, um, years ago. And out of the, all the data we got, one of the key pieces of data we found out was 54% of adults didn't know the difference between bumblebees and honeybees. They thought it was the same species. So when we, I use this slide um, to, to demonstrate that it's, they're completely different. Now, very often you will see save the bees and you will see hives, hexagons, honey and honeybees. And it's very much like me saying, I'm going to save the birds 
I'm going to keep some chickens because honeybees are livestock. They're not at risk of extinction. They're not in decline. They're very important pollinators. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to dish honeybees. They're, they're good and important pollinators, but they don't need saving at all. Uh, the other thing about honeybees is, you know, if you've got 50,000 workers in a, in a hive, honeybees are all one species. They only have short tongues. So honeybees have a two millimeter tongue length, whereas in bumblebees, my 24, 25 species will have different length tongues. So some have two millimeters and one bumblebee, the great garden bumblebee, has one that's 19 millimeters long. It's almost as long as its body which means that they can pollinate a greater variety of different plants. And for, for those of you who've got woodlands full of uh, foxgloves, absolutely what a wonderful plant for, for bees. So honeybees, as we know, live in hives, only one species. They do this marvelous waggle dance. Only the, col the colony does survive the winter. And in the past, the hives have been badly affected by varroa mite. Whereas bumblebees, wild, underground nests and when we talk about your woodlands and spaces where they can nest and hibernate woodlands are absolutely key 18 social species of bumblebee and six cuckoo species now woodlands are actually renowned for some of the cuckoo species and these work well i could spend ages on cuckoo species but very briefly some of our social species have a host cuckoo species and the social species, let's take the buff-tailed bumblebee, it'll emerge in February, March time. It'll make its nest. It'll grow its colony. It, its cuckoo species, its host cuckoo species, will emerge later. And that cuckoo species will seek out a buff-tailed nest. It'll infiltrate itself into the nest. Mm. It'll get the smell of the nest on it. And once it's been in there for a while, it will have a fight with the queen, it'll sting the queen to death, drag her out of the, the nest, and then the workers will then look after the eggs produced by the cuckoo species. So very much like the cuckoo bird. Um, and it's uh, they're fascinating. If you ever want to have a look on our website about cuckoo species, they're really, really, really interesting. Most bumblebees have nests 50 to 400 workers. They don't do dancing, but they do have smelly feet. And they, when they land on a flower, they leave a pheromone scent on the petal. And so the next bumblebee that comes along can smell that the nectar and pollen has been taken from that particular flower and therefore doesn't have to waste energy landing there. Uh, only the queen survives the winter, the whole colony dies. And the reason why uh, our bumblebees are declining is due to habitat shortages. So very quickly about their life cycle. Here's a queen. She's emerged in February, March from hibernation. First thing she's doing is looking for food. And for those of you that have goat willow, Salix carex in your woods, that is absolutely the top food for emerging bumblebees. It's a really key food, uh, the pussy willow, when it comes out. So she feeds herself up and then after a while, she'll look for a nest site. And sometimes she will see bumblebees uh, going low, zigzagging over the, the ground, and she's smelling with her antennae uh, any abandoned rodent's nest. They love the smell of rodent's nest, and because an abandoned rodent's nest will have nesting material in it, it'll work really well for her. So once she's found her nest, she then makes a mound of pollen, she collects pollen, then she extrudes, extrudes from her abdomen some wax, and with her mandible, she'll fashion it into the most exquisite little wax cup. Um, and if you ever find a bumblebee nest, have a look for this little fairy cup. And within that cup, she'll put nectar that she's collected. So once she's laid her eggs on the pollen mound, she will need to keep herself alive for four or five days. So she'll suck nectar from the little cup and <coughs> eat some of the pollen. And like most insects, it goes eggs, pupae, and you can see little white pupae, uh, larvae, baby bumblebees. And all the baby bumblebees are girls that are born first, and the girls 
do all the work. They look after the queen, they brood the eggs, they go out, they collect the pollen and nectar, they clean the nest, they keep everything going in the nest. Later on in the season, the bumblebee queen will lay unfertilized eggs and they are the males. And the males do two things. They have sex and they get drunk, that's it. Once they're born, they leave the nest. Sometimes on a summer's morning, if you see a bumblebee splayed out on a flower, it'll be a male because they have nowhere else to go. And they'll disperse and they'll try to find nests elsewhere uh, to hang outside, waiting for the queen to lay the next batch of eggs, which are the new queens. And then the new queens will emerge and the males will mate with them. Uh, and then unfortunately, everybody dies apart from the new queens who then go into hibernation for the following year. These are some of the most common bumblebees and we do on our website, you'll see lots of BID training sessions, really good videos, very simple ones about how to learn to identify them. Um, we always start with the color of their bottom, white tailed bumblebee, buff tailed bumblebee, um, uh, the red tailed bumblebee and the common carder, which is very ginger or ginger bee. And now we have one very important to you guys, which is the tree bumblebee. Now the story about this little bumblebee was that it came over from the France in the boot of Dave Gawson's car. But we actually know that they fly across the channel. Uh, there's another really good story, a really good research paper about how bumblebees have ancestral memory, but that's for another day. Anyway, this bee used to be called the Ula La Bee because it came from France. And it's exploited a niche our native bumblebees don't do. And that is, it lives in trees, it likes to build its nest in trees or under eaves or in bird boxes. And it's done incredibly well. Um, this map is out of date now, I need to renew it. They're right up into Scotland, right up into the north of Scotland and over into I Ireland as well. It has done really, really well. And it hasn't in any way been competitive so far from our data with our native bees. So this is about the work of the trust. We're what's called trusted advisors to the government. They trust us. I don't think we trust them very much at the moment, but we are, um, uh, we work on the pollinator advisory steering groups for all of the, the different devolved countries. Um, the best one by a long way is the All Island Pollinator Plan. They've done incredibly well. Um, but it means that we can keep a track of how the government is doing in supporting our pollinators. And this is the big one. We really, if we're going to reverse the decline in bumblebees, we really have to raise awareness of how important they are. Uh, and we do this in a multitude of different ways, tonight just being one of them. Uh, and then we are a science-based, evidence-led charity. So we're very keen to keep improving our knowledge and our evidence and collecting our data. So that's another really strong part of our work. So science, we still work with all the universities. We are supervised PhD students. We're still making sure that our interventions and our work with bees are actually reversing their decline. So adding to knowledge is a really, really important part of our work. And our main thrust has been to increase the availability of flower rich habitats. So as I said earlier, we lost 97% of our flower rich habitat after the Second World War. So if we're going to do anything at all, uh, we just need to increase habitat that's suitable for bumblebees and then we will start seeing an uptick in their, in their returns. So this was just some of the pictures that, uh, that we've worked with, where we've worked with farmers to increase their, their, their margins and their land for pollinators. And this is some of the, this is a beautiful woodland on the left. Uh, I don't know if any of you have uh, bluebell woodlands, but these open woodland areas and these rides and hedges and edges are extremely important uh, to the to our our bumblebees. So, just a, a a few bits on managing your wood for bumblebees. So, 
I think a lot of you, when you think of bee friendly habitat, you might think of sunny flower field gardens or meadows with a variety of colorful blooms and busy buzzy visitors zipping between them. And indeed, these are important habitats for pollinators. It provides them with pollen and nectar to survive. And naturally, this is where most of the attention goes in terms of creating and restoring habitats to help them. But when we look at the big picture, and we start to understand that other habitats and their connectivity to flowery areas are just as important for pollinators. And access to the right kind of woodland habitat is central to the success of many of the species, you know, life cycles. So if you've got woodlands, for example, that are, are next door to crops, so there's a really important implication for crop pollination. And recent, really astonishingly, Recent research found a greater number of bumblebee species in greater abundance within field margins adjacent to woodlands as opposed to open field margins. So at a landscape level, woodlands serve a really important function offering not just food, but shelter, respite from intensively managed agricultural land, uh, and this does not imply all woodlands or all forest habitats are good for pollinators. In fact, some forests can act as a barrier to foraging activity. But if managed well, they can offer the whole package of food, shelter and connectivity. So these open rides are really, really important. Uh, and I don't know, again, I, I presume all of your small woodlands have a variety of different areas within them. I hope I'm making the right assumption that it's not just full of trees. But uh, and I think densely, obviously, densely packed conifer plantations offer the least value. But it is the diverse natural woodlands with a good variety of species and structure that offers the best opportunities. Light is the commodity that's most in demand for woodland plants. And this is the main thing that must be managed to maximize the potential for pollinators. Often the only flowers in woodlands are those which adopt the strategy of flowering early before the tree canopy uh, closes over. There's an interesting tree and um, I have one actually in my garden. It used to be a whole street of them and that is lime trees. And there's an old saying about lime trees, which says a good lime tree is worth an acre of clover. So limes bloom in late June and July and the flowers last for two to three weeks and are pollinated solely by insects and by bees. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about lime trees is they exude a sap and in their pollen a nectar that is a, a narcotic. It's caffeine and the bees just cannot get enough of it. And sometimes if you have lime trees and you look underneath, you'll see a load of spaced out bumblebees on the ground underneath the lime trees because they've all OD'd on the, on the pollen and nectar in the tree. But it's a very, very good tree for, for pollinators. And sycamore is the same. It's another really valuable tree for bees flowering early in the season, April, May, and it produces masses, copious amounts of nectar and pollen for bees. And if you can think about your woodland area of having something that is flowering throughout the flower flight season for bees, right through from February when they emerge, which depends what part of the country you're in, right through to um, October when they go into hibernation. Now that's a much shorter life in somewhere like the north of Scotland, where they tend to emerge much later in the year, around late April, May, and then they hibernate in September time. But the other really, really good trees, hazel, alder and willow, those are the early sources of pollen, really important food for queen bees to allow her to start egg laying early in the year. So I'll just go back to that one because I just wanted to say a few things about rides. Uh, and this is the same edge habitat principles that can be applied to woodland rides. Really expansive out. So you've got 
big margin before the woodland actually actually starts. Hedges and edges. Oh, these are just so valuable. Absolutely, really valuable. So edge habit, edge habitats are really important to manage. And particularly the south and east facing edges, which tend to be preferred by pollinators as they receive the morning and midday sun, which warms them up. The north facing spots are utilized when the weather is too hot and dry. So good edges, unmown, unkempt, providing opportunity for important herbaceous species like hogweed, thistles, ragwort, and knapweed to grow. Again, really, really important um, for maintaining some flower rich pollen and nectar for the bees. Many wildflower species pop up naturally with the right management, um, though some people I do know in woodlands will sow wildflower strips around the border or plant the dative uh, bluebells or wood anemones, things like that. If the grasses dominate, taking a cut in late summer and removing the arisings each year will help lower the nutrient levels and allow wildflowers to flourish. Wildflowers flourish in very uh, low quality soil. They don't like rich fertilized soil. But so if we know that woodland edges provide valuable food and shelter for pollinators, maybe you can fence off the wood bit and keep that edge habitat uh, clear, creating, a, I don't know, a few meters of uncultivated or unmown habitat. It's really good. Um, the other thing that the open areas or the edge habitats can do is obviously create that light area again. And that really gives uh, advantage to things like bluebells, primroses, wood anemones, violets and bugle to keep the same on the rides to keep that light area. Um, so this is an interesting concept. Um, and I don't know whether some of you have heard of Wood Meadows. There was a charity called the Wood Meadow Trust uh, that's just been absorbed into plant life. Fantastic charity that did an amazing amount of work on Wood Meadows. And the principle behind Wood Meadows was that you have big open glade areas within the wood, again, allowing that light in. Uh, and there's a, a chap called George Peterkin that said that the general point is that meadows are good habitats if they have shrubs on their margins and woods are good habitat if they have grassland among the trees, particularly grassland that allows herbs to flower. And if you want to look further into wood meadows and how to create a wood meadow area in your woods, have a look at the Hags Wood trust and I'll send that detail over to Sarah but wood meadows are really excellent areas really full of different habitats perfect for pollinators uh, and they make links up uh, towards other woods as well so highly recommend having a look into wood meadows that's just a lovely picture of a bumblebee so look at the length of that tongue um, and it is the long tongued bumblebees that will go for things like foxgloves, like comfrey, like bluebells even still got the tubular uh, thing, tubular flower, tubular thing, tubular flower. And again, nesting sites, woodlands are absolutely perfect for nesting sites. All those little round things were the egg, where the eggs were um, for the bumblebees. And they're really, really, I don't know if you have children or grandchildren, if you find a bumblebee nest and you can get a spade and lift, once it's it's uh, been gone, all the bumblebees have died, if you can lift it up and put it in a Tupperware, it's great for show and tell at schools. The children are fascinated by the different elements. And again, if you can find that little nectar cup, that's even more special as well. But woodlands, because of the rodents that you may have in there, the little voles, the shrews, the wood mice, all create nests underground, all fill it with nesting material. There's a lot of bumblebee nests in woodlands. 
So keep an eye out for those. You don't have to do anything in your woods to, to create a nesting site. They're just going to be abundantly there. And certainly piles of logs as well also offer really good sites. That's just another fantastic picture of a bumblebee. Do you know they beat their wings at 200 beats a second? Uh, and it's all to do with their muscles in their thorax. So that's a white tailed bumblebee on some lavender. I was going to start, I was going to see if I could play a, I don't know whether this is going to work, Sarah. Uh, I hope people, Sarah, if you can put finger up, thumb up, if you can hear this. Can people hear that? No? Joss is saying, no, you can't hear that. Um, I'll tell you what, Jill, if you send me the link, I can send it to our... Okay. Attendees. Yeah. I'll send you that. Well, it will be on the um, on this anyway, so you can listen to it there. Oh, yeah, I think I need to have to do something silly with Zoom to get you to hear it. So here's a, a lovely bumblebee on a tomato flower doing the job. Uh, that we absolutely need them to do. So just to end the talk, the last 10 minutes or, or, or so is what we can all do to help bumblebees. Uh, and I think probably all of you here today who have small woodland areas are probably unknowingly and unwittingly doing a great deal for bumblebees just by managing your woodland. But if there's some top tips that you've learned today that you can adjust to, to make it even more pollinator friendly, that would be great. So these are, we, we tend to promote in the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, we, we really tend to promote old fashioned flowers. So um, obviously our wildflowers, uh, our herbs are really good and there's lots of woodland herbs uh, that flower at different times of the year. Obviously the, uh, the vegetables probably aren't um, probably uh, good for you guys unless some of you have allotments, in which case still keep uh, planting the lavenders along the edges for your pollinators uh, and alliums as well. They're really, really good. Uh, and that wild garlic and that tricorn garlic that you get in woodlands, absolutely brilliant for bumblebees as well. Uh, and so we have an amazing tool called Be Kind. Uh, it's on our website. It's free to use. It's got over 700 of the best bee friendly flowers. It also has a little icon on them to show you which ones have the highest nectar and pollen. So there's super flowers that are perfect for, you can score your garden. You could even score your woodland for bee friendliness. And then it will give you another 10 plants uh, that you could plant to ensure that you've got something flowering over the whole period the bees are. As I say, completely free to use, fantastic tool. It's won lots of awards. Great for your garden, if not, if not your woodland. Now, as I walk down the street in Lymington and somebody, friend will come up to me, they'll always say, how are the bees doing, Jill? And I won't be able to say how the bees are doing without Bee Walk. So we started Bee Walk in 2010, uh, and it's a, a national scheme to collect, collect abundant stage age, based on the same uh, bee, uh, walk as uh, butterfly conservation. So we knew, we worked with butterfly conservation on this. We knew that some people who collected data on butterflies were also interested in bumblebees and could identify bumblebees. So we used exactly the same methodology. And it's very simple. You uh, set a transect, a walk, one to two kilometers, can be anywhere you like. If it's your woodland, it can be a ride out down an edge over a field. We try to get lots of different habitats on the walk. And then you walk that route once a month. You check on the bumblebees. You have to know a little bit about your bumblebee ID. Uh, so you identify the bumblebee and the flower that it's feeding on. Uh, and then you put it in on our bee walk site as data. And it allows us to understand how the population of bumblebees are doing. Now, when we started, obviously, we, we only had about 35 bee walkers all trained up uh, 
putting data in, it was difficult to have any sort of relevant analysis from that. We now have over a thousand bee walkers all across the UK. Uh, and if everybody here today became a bee walker in your woods, that would be fantastic. We have uh, Helen Dickinson it, uh, runs the Bee Walk scheme for us and she would help you, she's a mentor. We also have Bee Walk mentors scattered across the country who would help you set up a Bee Walk. But it's really important for us to understand how the bees are doing. And the only way we will know that is by collecting this data. Um, we have a fantastic uh, campaign called Be the Change. Uh, and this also came out of that um, audience insights work we did four or five uh, years ago, whereby we knew that we, what came out of that was that people uh, didn't have time, didn't have a lot of money, were worried about volunteering and committing to volunteering. Uh, and so we developed uh, a campaign based on micro actions. And these are really easy, simple things. It might be just de deadheading your roses or, or other flowers so that they grow, they, they flower more often. It might just be, you know, learning to identify a couple of bumblebees. It might just be talking to your children or grandchildren about how wonderful these are. Uh, it's a fantastic resource. All the resources on it are free. There are absolutely loads, particularly to do with gardening, but it's a really, really great campaign. Uh, we had we, we had it funded for a year, but it's in its third year now because it's become so popular. Uh, and that's the, the website for it. It's a sort of micro website off our main one. Uh, and that is just a gorgeous bumblebee emerging from a crocus. So how could you help? Talk to children. You know, I go into schools and I say, and there's all the children sat there and I do assemblies. And I say, what do you know about bees? And they know two things. They sting and they make honey. They don't know about our food. They don't know about bumblebees. They don't know about solitary bees. We, we, we've sit, they're frightened of bees. They, they just think they're out to get them, that they sting them. So I'd like the next generation to really love bees. And the only way we're going to do that is to show them how great these bees are. Uh, leaving a legacy, uh, I know a lot of charities want you to do that, but it's a great way to support any charity. Volunteering, particularly the Bee Walk volunteering. A lot of our volunteers do uh, different events, uh, send stalls, crochet bees and all sorts of things. Gardening, of course. If you work for a company, make a charity of the year. That's great. Have really big wide rides in your woods, please. <laughs> <laughs> and be the change, have a look at, uh, at be the change, but also talk to your friends about how wonderful the bumblebees are. And of course, you can join us for a, a micro £25 a year. That's a cup of coffee a month, isn't it, or something like that. Um, if you join the trust, it just makes it so much more important for us to be able to use that money. Uh, it's called unrestricted money to really work hard on our projects to reverse their decline. Uh, Jane Goodall, particular um, heroine of mine, I think she's absolutely terrific. I think we can do so many simple, easy things uh, and we can make a huge difference. And that's a goodbye from me and a goodbye from her. So I shall stop sharing and be available for questions, Sarah. Uh, Jill, thank you so much. That talk was, well, it makes me realise I only had a surface level of understanding. Um, I really, uh, I'm, I feel proud to be uh, paying homage to the Ula La Bee today. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I promise you that when we have a, a foraging talk in the future, I will encourage people to leave the wild garlic alone. Yeah. Um, so oh, I just opened the chat actually. Yeah. Uh, and there's a couple of questions there that I can. Oh, um, Kat, you're developing a wood meadow. Great. That's fantastic news. Uh, instead of importing bees, why are they not bred here? Well, here's the thing. So we know that bumblebees eat two things. They need pollen and they need nectar. 
Now, nectar is easy to, uh, you, you can have a synthetic nectar, which is just sugar. So feeding, uh, uh, you know, if you're going to create a farm of bumblebees, you've got the sugar, but where are you going to get the pollen from? So you can't go around individually as human beings and collect pollen from flowers. So over in Europe, where they have a huge amount of land and a lot more wildflower meadows, they actually have a huge amount of honeybee hives. Honeybees are absolutely brilliant at collecting pollen. They put scrapers on the side of the hives. The bees go in, scrapes the pollen off. Uh, it's then sterilized and fed to the bumblebees. So that's one reason why we could never breed or never have an industry here of breeding bumblebees. We simply don't have the land. And I think all our beekeepers would be very, very annoyed to lose all their pollen. It's a huge, commercially farmed bumblebees is a huge global industry. It's been going for 20, 30 years. And if you, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, I've been to one of the hangars there over in, uh, in Belgium, it's massive. We, you know, if we want more bumblebees here in this country, the simplest way to do it is to grow more flowers. Um, so I'm sorry, we, we can't breed them here. We just don't have the facility. Uh, it, I think it'd be the wrong thing to do. We just, you know, whenever you breed something in a closed environment, it, it can it can be a, a viral source as well. And so new viruses uh, will come up. So. So why do bumblebees pollinate tomato plants if there's no nectar to take? Because they're just brilliant. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> because they've evolved together. Uh, and yeah, it's really hard work for the bumblebee to get that net pollen out of the anthers. And yet they do. Now, whether it's because the pollen is a particular high quality, I don't know. So, Philip, I, I wish I knew the answer to that, but I may try and find out. I've never been asked that question before. Uh, so what about water? How far is it okay to be? So bumblebees get a lot of their um, hydration through the nectar. So they don't actually need a great deal of water. If there was, uh, in, and, in, and in gardens, we always say a shallow uh, tray with some pebbles in it so they can land on the pebbles and, and drink the water. But it, it doesn't need to be, you know, they'll find enough in a woodland for sure, unless you have an incredibly dry woodland. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you'll be fine, you know, for water. Uh, did you say the only pollinator is tomato? Yes, I did. Now, bumble uh, bumblebees, tomatoes can be self-pollinating, but the reason that they're used in the big industrial um, greenhouses is because the supermarkets want uh, good quality, they need them all the same size, and the only way you're gonna get that is not from self-pollination, but through actually being pollinated by by tomato, uh, by bumblebees. But no other insect can do that. It is only bumblebees can do buzz pollination. Oh, they keep, keep coming in, crikey. Uh, uh, because they store pollen for the young. Yes, uh, they do. Bumblebees do. Uh, the the young baby bumblebees, the girls, they'll all eat pollen. How can we support solo bumblebees? Linda, tell me more. What are solo bumblebees? Where's Linda? I, I, I was referring to the um, bumblebees, which are in the, they don't travel in. I don't know what the word is. Oh, oh the solitary bees. Solitary, that's the word. I've solitary heard. bees, yeah. How can we support solitary bees? Well, whatever you do for bumblebees, you'll actually be helping solitary bees as well. But solitary bees, by their nature, they're lonely bees. They live by themselves. They don't live in colonies. You know those bee hotels? Uh, bee hotels are pretty good for solitary bees. And also piles of um, wood are great for solitary bees. Um, and I think if you find them nesting in, you'll find a lot of, of them nest in, in your lawn. Just try not to mow your lawn while they're nesting. But they, they want flowers too. They want flowers too. So, I mean, my answer to everything is going to go grow more flowers, really. Um, here's a myth or fact. 
If I find a sleepy bumblebee, does it need a sugary drink or is it just resting? Ah, oh, Ruth, well, there could be multiple reasons if you find a sleepy bumblebee. Firstly, it might just be coming to the end of its life. So sometimes um, the girl, the worker bumblebees will only really last four to five weeks. And if she looks very, or if the bumblebee looks quite battered and the wings are sh a bit shed and she's faded, it might just be that she's coming to the end of her life. Um, if it look, looks like quite a healthy bumblebee, it's got all its colors and its fur, uh, and it looks it looks newish. Uh, the best thing to do if you have flowers nearby is to lift it up. I, I promise you it won't sting you and put it on a flower, because a lot of the time when we're walking around somewhere, we're not carrying a sugary drink with us. Um, but, yeah, if we can lift it up and put it on a flower, uh, it can it can then get at the nectar. If you don't have any flowers and you do happen to have I've seen these little bee vive capsules that you can put on a on a, a key ring that has got um, sugary water in it. Uh, a sugary drink is fine, 50% water and sugar, but do not give them honey because honey contains diseases that can spread to bumblebees. Uh, and we've, we've now found there's two diseases now that have spread from honeybees. Deformed wing virus is now prevalent in bumblebees and that is a honeybee uh, disease. And the other one, which I've momentarily forgotten, so yes, a sleepy bumblebee might be just at the end of its life, put it on a flower or give it uh, a little sugary water if, if you've got some nearby. Uh, where do they hibernate in the ground? Yes, they do. And they tend to hibernate in tussocky grass or under hedges um, uh, and mostly on eastern and northern sides because what they don't want to do is the first sunny day in February or March and think, oh, it's spring, I'm coming out and then get three weeks of snow. So they tend to, to hibernate on the sort of cooler eastern, northern sides. Um, but yes, underground, dusky grass, bits of wood. Uh, the picture I showed you on the life cycle was a, a member showed us that there was a begonia that she was growing. She lifted it out of the pot and there was a bumblebee nesting uh, in there. How it got in there, I don't know. But yeah, in the ground. Uh, is the national loss of ash tree an issue for bumblebees? Not greatly because um, they're not very good for, for pollen and nectar. The flowers from the ash tree isn't very good. I have seen um, I do a survey in a woodland in Oxford up on the Ditchley estate. And I don't know whether you found this, anybody else has found this in woodlands, but some of the ash trees that had died back seem to be regenerating. I don't know whether that, that's happening, but maybe they're fighting off the, the disease. But no, not a great issue for bumblebees, Ruth. Uh, thank you, that's good. No, the bumblebees didn't bring in the virus that caused ash dieback. It was us bringing in uh, ash whips from the continent that brought in ash dieback. Uh, some of the diseases that imported bumblebees can uh, bring in have quite complicated Latin names. Please don't test me on those just at the moment. Uh, uh, thanks so much. I have wild pigs in my wood. They are very destructive, but they're rummaging. Uh, it could do, but you know, it's nature. Um, the biggest predator of bumblebees is badgers. Badgers absolutely love bumblebees. They're, they're like sweeties for them. You know, they have a nectar sac in their abdomen, which is like just sugar. It's, it's wonderful. They love them. So the biggest predator is is um, bumblebees, they're, is badgers. They'll dig up a bumblebee's nest. They'll, they'll smell it. And because they've got such tough mouths, you know, even if the bumblebees try to sting them, they'll, they'll survive that. But I don't know that wild pigs would actually, you know, if the bumblebee nest is quite well underground, I, I think wild pigs might just uh, do the surface. So I don't, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm Nadine, I'm sort of guessing on that one. But I, I like to think we let nature take its course. And I, I would love to have wild pigs in a wood, frankly. So you wouldn't. It's, I, 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 
it was I, I came in one day and it was like a farmer had gone rogue with his plow it oh it was you couldn't walk through it because it was just so undulating and they destroyed all my lovely grassland area and um, and they're quite okay, so I've changed my mind. I don't want badgers or wild pigs in my wood. <laughs> okay. Um, Anthony, you are correct. Ash dieback is not a virus. No, I never meant it to be transmitted by bees. I was trying to make an analogy to say, you know, with the imported bees, when we had ash dieback, it came in from the continent through uh, imported whips, ash whips, and the same thing could happen by bringing in imported bumblebees. We may get viruses spread to our native bumblebees. So I'm sorry if I confused you on that. It was it was an analogy I was trying to make. Hey, we're doing well. I've got to the end of the question, Sarah. Yeah, great. Um, what uh, the sorry, sorry, Jerry. No, go, go, go. Uh, one of the questions was, will we be able to have the your talk, um, the, the presentation for us to um, hand out? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I'll have to send it to you on a wee transfer because it's very big. Sure. But, yeah. Yeah, That's but fun. yeah, I'll drop that over to you tomorrow, Sarah. Brilliant. Thank you, Jill. And um... oh, hang on, we've got a new message here. Oh, thank you, Ruth. Well, um, I think I say on behalf of everybody uh, in our swag talk that Jill, you've enlightened us all. Uh, Thank you so much for taking the time to do this talk for us. And um, any questions that I have, if guys, if you uh, email them to me, then I'm I'm in contact with Jill. So I'm sure she'll be happy to answer them behind the scenes. Um, just, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I've really enjoyed it. I love talking about bumblebees. So it's been a joy. <laughs> um, we'll mention the bee walk uh, in, our, in our SWOG newsletter. And we'll try and get as many people to sign up to that incentive as we can. So... If nothing else, that's certainly something we'll, we'll definitely be doing. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. I should go and get my baked potato now. Enjoy that Jake, baked potato. You've earned it. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Jill. Cheerio.